So welcome everyone. I'm really honored uh, to have a distinguished panel here uh, to discuss one of the finest laboratories in Los Angeles for architectural innovation and, um, and conscientious and enlightened development. Um, the Conjunctive Points project in Culver City in South Los Angeles has really uh, redefined not only a uh, community, but um, a mentality and a strategy and a, a way of perceiving uh, the ability for uh, a kind of a collaboration of creative minds to come together to revitalize uh, areas in Los Angeles and establish models that can be replicated around the world. So today's discussion is really to think of conjunctive points and what uh, the people here have uh, created uh, that becomes a case study um, that redefines and, and then shifts us into a new trajectory uh, of Los Angeles, but also urbanism in general. Um, so first I'd like to introduce Frederick and Lori Semitar smith uh, Since the mid-1980s, Frederick and Lori Semitar smith have been developing the Conjunctive Points Urban Redevelopment Project in Culver City and South Los Angeles. Internationally recognized as a unique urban experiment in the fusion of art, architecture, and technology, Conjunctive Points has received more than 60 awards from organizations including the American Institute of Architects, Progressive Architecture Magazine, the Urban Land Institute, the Los Angeles Business Council, and the Chicago Athenaeum. Over the years, Semitar has attracted a prestigious tenant roster that includes Nike, Ogilvy, Sony Pictures, Delta Apparel, Red Bull, and Digital Fusion. Frederick uh, Semitar Smith first experienced his passion for building when he worked himself through college and construction. He then spent several years in Europe working as a writer and journalist, where he was greatly influenced by his association with Picasso, Madame Brock, and contacts with other key members of the European arts community, such as Chagall and Miro. Frederick moved back to California in the 1970s, where he built several high-tech facilities at the dawn of the high-tech industry in the Silicon Valley. These experiences, combined with a love of cubism, modern literature and higher math have formed the basis for his ambition to create a community that brings together technological advancement and the arts. Laurie Semitar smith has an extensive theatrical background. As a young teenager, she began eight years of training with the protege of the renowned Russian actor and director Mikhail Chekhov and spent many years of intensive study with a disciple of La Argentina, history's greatest exponent of Spanish classical dance. She went on to play leading roles in films, TV, and on the stage where she had the ingenue lead in the opening production of Los Angeles' Mark Taper Forum that we looked at earlier with uh, um, uh, David and Martin. Outside of their development company, Lori and Frederick have actively reshaped the region through their pivotal involvement with LA's public park system, the LA Police Department's Juvenile Division, the LA Free Clinic, and LACMA. Eric Owen Moss is the principal and lead designer of Eric Owen Moss Architects and has served as the director of SciArc uh, since 2002. Born and raised in LA, he received a Bachelor of Arts from the University of California at Los Angeles and holds a master's degrees in architecture from both the University of California at Berkeley College of Environmental Design and Harvard University's Graduate School of Design. Founded in 1973, Eric Owen Moss Architects has designed and constructed projects in the United States and around the world. The firm's work has garnered over 100 local, national, and international design awards and has been featured in 15 published monographs. In 2002, the firm won two competitions in St. Petersburg, Russia, one for the New Marinsky Theater, the second for the redevelopment of New Holland. In 2003, Eric Owen Moss Architects won the international competition for the Queens Museum of Art in New York. In 2006, they won the City of the Future competition, LA, New York, Chicago, sponsored by the History Channel. And in 2012, the firm won the competition for the redevelopment of downtown Albuquerque, which is currently in progress. Moss has received numerous honors throughout his career, including the Academy Award in Architecture from the American Academy of Arts and Letters in 1999, the AIA LA Gold Medal in 2001, and the Jenks Award from the Royal, uh, by the Royal Institute of British Architects in 2011. In 2010, Moss became the first foreign architect invited to curate a national pavilion at the Venice Architecture Biennale. He continues to teach, lecture, and exhibit his work around the globe. And Hugh Milstein is the co-founder and president of Digital Fusion. Digital Fusion is a leading creative services company and an innovator in photographic and fine art technology and archiving software. With a base in photography and an expansion into motion, Digital Fusion is a cutting-edge provider 
to major publications and entertainment outlets worldwide. Hugh's expertise in image making led him to be named to the 100 most important people in photography by American photographer. Hugh continues to design and develop new image styles and services that appear on digital newsstands, moving billboards, iPads, and mobile devices. He was one of the original tenants of Conjunctive Points and has since become a close friend and colleague of Frederick Laurie and Eric's. So I'd like to welcome all of them here today. So the story of this development is fascinating and um, many people are familiar with this project because of its high profile design um, and its mix of uh, creative tenants. But we'd like to start really from the beginning. Um, uh, I read that, Frederick, you said we wanted to make no place some place. And so we have a series of Im images that you can scroll through and th give us a sense of what you found uh, when you first arrived at this uh, development and how you were able to eventually over, uh, evolve it over time. So there's a screen there that allows you to see what we're showing. Okay. Um, this is a, a shot of, uh, actually I haven't seen these before, but this is a shot of Culver City and uh, the areas that we're working in, Culver City and Los Angeles. Um, it's just the general area. And what do you do the next one? These are some aerial shots of the same area. So see, we're tracking uh, through the years. Yeah, here. we're tracking through the years here. This starts in, I can't see it. It's I'm 1928. Sorry. 1928. This is 38. 38, so this must be 48. This is 58. 68. 56. 56. 65. 1965. 76. 76, that's when we started to get involved. 89. 89, is that it? And 2002. And 2002. And 2000, well, I don't know what this one is. Can't 13. read it. Huh? 2013. 2013. Okay. Um, this generally is the area that we call conjunctive points. Uh, in gross square footage, it's well over a million square feet. It includes uh, practically 50 projects that Eric has done with us. And uh, all of the uh, pieces that you uh, saw in the reel that was shown was built or built by uh, Peter Brown. He's in the center up here. And uh, raised, just raised his hand. We have our own construction company. Um, I think one of the things that designs us separate and apart from other people is that, I'm just going to go, these are before and after shots, is that we've remained with the same architect uh, since the very beginning in 1986. And we also permit the architects to be involved very early in all of our original work. So when we even have the idea of a project in the very beginning, we bring them in. This is the, this is the before, this is the after. Um, this building was <clears throat> very unique, has a lot of influences on it from films Eric and I were looking at the time and some painters that I knew once upon a time. This is an old industrial building. I just want to say that's the first building uh, privately built in South Central Los Angeles since the LA riots. Mm -hmm. And just for you to know historically how difficult that was, the area in spite of the message of the riots, the area was redlined by all the banks. Of course, that's illegal, but real. And for us to find the money to be able to build that building was bits and pieces here and there that we kind of scooped out of other projects to make it happen. Frederick also had to sell some artworks that he valued uh, greatly. And so we're very, very proud of that building because that building was trying to make a stand against the, the wave of negativity that was hitting that neighborhood. So that brings up an important point of the whole vision for the project, that you were not here to uh, kind of create an office park, you were creating a community, you were taking a, a position on the potential of Los Angeles, uh, its future, but you wanted to go about it in a very deliberate and strategic and creative way. So. Perhaps we can talk about your feeling about the condition of Los Angeles at that moment, um, your investment, and why you felt tied particularly to this, to this site uh, rather than other areas in L.A. 
Well, I think that I think that the reason that we came into this area was because I had knowledge of it. Um, my father had had a factory in this area and it permit me to know about it, so I knew, knew a great deal about the value of the buildings and the infrastructure that was inside them. That's number one. Then number two, um, I wanted to be in an area where I could institute a social change. I realized that we're in a design-oriented uh, community here in, at the Getty, and uh, most of the world really looks at our projects from the point of view of design. But we look at them from the point of view of function. We have uh, four pillars to the business, which is community, jobs, architecture, and art. And we try to combine them all. Uh, trying to take uh, no place and make it some place was something that was really just developed with Eric as a, as a statement, an oral statement. I believe it was even his idea to use those particular words. But the idea from our viewpoint, my wife and mine, was to go into an area that had been completely abandoned. It had been about 97% abandoned. And to institute a visual change on the exterior, and we decided to use architecture. So the majority of men that I went to visit at that time, thinking back to the, to the time when we began, and the architects I vis visited were very arrogant and uh, didn't want to hear of any social values or trying to attach architecture to social values. They knew more or less all the answers. Uh, fortunately for me, uh, Eric became a tenant, and um, while he was in the building, uh, I stopped by one day, and uh, he was reading T.S. Eliot's quartets, and I thought, well, God, this guy's not an idiot. <laughs> or he is. <laughs> no, later when we got detailed conversations about Schopenhauer and uh, Kierkegaard, I knew he was an idiot, but it's... <laughs> But, 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 a, but a beautiful idiot, you know. Uh, anyway, uh, the main thing that struck me about him was this incredible humanity and warmth and uh, a generous smile. And so I told him a little bit about my ambitions and that I wanted them incorporated in the design. And, you know, he kept on saying no problem. But I, I feel that, uh, of course, he was looking for a job, but I feel or, or he, he wanted to get something to pay Still his rent. <laughs> I wanted to get someone to pay his rent or exchange work for rent. But I think that the, the major thing that came across was an identity of somebody who had a, had, a, had a likewise ambition as I did to try to service humanity in some way. I think that the most interesting thing for me is that um, if you don't go into these projects that we've gone into with a lot of goodwill, they don't work. And that includes the architecture. And what Eric brings to the architecture is so much goodwill in terms of innovative design that it leaves very often people breathless. I, I think that, that is the key. We went into a neighborhood that was 97% vacant. Very high crime. Drugs, prostitution, chop shops, you name it. It was a very dangerous neighborhood and nobody wanted to be there. That's why it was 97% vacant. Frederick had a, a vision, if you will, that with architecture, he could change the whole atmosphere, the whole feeling of the place, and announce in a great big way, meaning of the size of buildings, that change has come to this neighborhood. And he needed an architect who was open-minded enough to be willing to do some very radical, avant-garde, creative, experimental architecture. We didn't dare build something that was vanilla, that was just the normal, conservative, same old thing you see everywhere in every city and every country. That would not have delivered a message of change. We were extraordinarily fortunate to come into contact with Eric Moss. Yes, he was a tenant, but uh, that's just the sideline. The main thing is we had the good fortune to be able to hook up with him, and Eric was the first architect of uh, all the group of architects Frederick had gone to and sought help from. Eric was the first one who was willing to take on that challenge. He was not afraid to do experimental architecture, and when I say afraid, we all know when you experiment in whatever field, there's a good percentage that you will fail. And Eric was not afraid of failure. Yeah, and I think the thing also that is very interesting is that 
The first person I actually tried to hire to help me in the project was a man named Freddie Capelli. He was the head of Renaissance studies at UCLA because, you know, somewhat educated, I decided, well, hell, I'd go to the Renaissance and get my inspiration. Um, and Freddie told me that uh, the major thing that separated the Renaissance from any other period was they developed their own sense of beauty. Their own sense of beauty. Their own sense of beauty. And what I saw in the work of Eric Moss was an individualized sense of beauty. And he was chasing it all the time. And he was constantly redrawing, constantly redoing, looking for some sort of special essence. And whether Eric's an artist or an architect is something that is blurred in my mind, but I know in the professional world he's an architect. And um, I, I, think, I, I think that we were well suited for each other with each other's ambitions. By the way, this is an old factory, and then you look at the next one, and this is what we built, Peter built, afterwards. And it's, it's quite remarkable, and of course I don't have this ability to twist and turn it or bring you in close, but go down to Culver City and take a look at it. So as we transition to speaking about the architecture, uh, you mentioned 97% vacant, and yet existing structures there, a uh, considerable number. And so you approach Eric Owen Moss, and um, it's an exciting opportunity, I'm sure, for you, Eric, but you're also not looking at necessarily a clean slate because part of your vision is to adapt the existing structures in a sensitive and a creative way. So how did you first approach the challenge of um, working within this existing fabric, and that's become a, another important dimension of this development as a model of adaptive reuse, not just tearing down and starting uh, from scratch. Well, I think what's in interesting about the, the process is that it never worked from an a priori formulation of what architecture should be. So there was, there was room, there was, there was substantial latitude to invent projects because the Smiths owned big pieces, big chunks of land. Even the conventional definitions of my property, your property, his property, her property didn't necessarily follow. I mean, the project that's, that's on the screen, for instance, it would be hard to characterize the project. It's a building built over a building. So uh, whether, it, I mean, it's a hybrid of some sort or another. Um, certainly not a conventional kind of either you remodel it or you tear it down or you save a piece and change a piece. And what we did, and I think we're able to do this, and, and as any architect in, in, in the building knows, without some uh, a major support, energy, sympathy, interest, curiosity, and I think above all, willingness to risk uh, uh, taking chances based on the assumption that there's something uniquely to be gained by working in this way. Mm -hmm. And I think there, uh, the, the discourse has changed now. So you flip on the TV and everybody's outside the box. And the idea of risk, whether it's really risk or not, we could have a discussion about that. But I think at the time when this originated, there was a fairly clear line of what, in a proprietary sense, one could build or should build. And I think, simply put, they, Laurie and Frederick were, were perfectly willing to, to transgress or go over the line and see what we could invent. I don't think we ever looked at any of the work typologically as this is this kind of building or that kind of building or new or old. And in the end, I, when I talk about these things, I don't show so much old to new, although old to new is a topic and it immediately brings up the conservation side of the thing. But in the end, the building is the building. And whatever the ingredients are, those pieces come together and then you have to talk about the, the result. And in a slightly broader sense, any building anywhere, even if you sit it in the Sahara or the Gobi Desert, has a particular context, orientation, weather, landform, and so on and so on. So in the broadest sense, all architecture has to attend or ignore or denigrate or accommodate a whole series of factors. And if in some cases those are existing buildings, 
and you have to decide what to do with those buildings, then that's part of the game. And I read that one of the philosophies behind the development, uh, and the architecture and the spaces themselves, that you were saying you were not just creating spaces, you were creating events. So you are creating a place and a certain level of vibrancy at different scales. And that's something that we can now begin to talk with Hugh about, that you're now uh, working in these spaces. You've been a part of the development for many time, in, uh, for a long time in different spaces, uh, so different buildings within the complex. You, when I first met you, you immediately uh, walk me around the building and describe the layers of the structure. It was uh, kind of a sense of archaeology that you were unraveling in all these different dimensions of the structure, and yet you said it was still tailored to your, your use. Well, it's, and it's amazing. This is the, where we currently live. Uh, I guess that's our house that you guys built. Um, what's, I don't think I've ever shared with you this story, but I can remember getting lost in this area uh, early 80s, driving around in my car, rolling up the window and trying to find my the quickest way out, thinking that it was, serious, no kidding, and all these years later to, to think that this is there is really a stunning transformation. And when you talk about making a statement, going from nothing to this, I, you, you couldn't have given me a wad of cash and said, your company is going to be on this street in 15 or 20 years. I wouldn't have believed you. So to be there and to see this really speaks volumes for what not only they envisioned, but what they've created and I can tell you that our company, our culture, our employees, our clients, our outreach benefits on an, on an hourly basis because we live in a piece of art. And we help others that come in either create it, digest it, explain it, work on it. And uh, it's, there's a, a synergy that's difficult to describe because, um, because of it, but we benefit every moment uh, that we're in there and we're thankful that we, we have an opportunity that these, these buildings exist. We focus very, very strongly on community and, and not in a, a, uh, in a sense that is normally defined. Uh, uh, we only like tenants who are intelligent. And, um, then why'd you let us in? <laughs> well, it's because you're really intelligent. Uh, one of the greatest examples of true intelligence is to, to deny it. Um, I think that, uh, um, you know, Hugh and John, and they've been with, been with us almost 14 years. And John Moeller is Hugh's partner right here. And Kurt Kratchman has developed two companies in our buildings, and he's been with us 12 years. Um, I think that, you know, it, it, it's a statement, in fact, that our community as such is well known. And if you're going to be a startup, you want to be in our community if you're in L.A. And uh, as far as major companies are concerned, let it be said also that we have over 20 billion dollar companies that are represented in the various buildings we have, over 20. And we have over 75 tenancies. So and go back I think to what, just since he's dropped such big figures, the real importance of that is we came from a place where no one dared be. And now all these billion dollar companies have flocked there. And the question is, the real question is why? What is there that makes them want to be there? And it's what we have tried to achieve is this sense of community that people who are creative, although they may be in different fields, can interact with each other and feel more stimulated, more inspired each day that they go to work because of the kind of people who are very near them in other offices or other studios, plus one of the major ambitions of the architecture, which Eric fulfilled so well, is we wanted to create structures that people going to work inside of would feel that stimulation, the creative juices would start to flow because they were inside the right geometric structures as opposed to the kind of structures which actually quelch your, your creativity, which unfortunately I have to say most of the buildings in the world do that. And Eric, you've uh, stated that the approach for this development was the antithesis of off-the-shelf ideology. Um, and that earlier you mentioned that each 
new building is a new opportunity to explore a, a, a new problem and reveal a new solution. And yet, there is a kind of custom fit that uh, each tenant tends to enjoy when they uh, start to occupy these spaces. So could you describe the process of um, you know, coming up with the new project, but first understanding who's going to occupy that space and how that uh, grounds uh, your, your strategies? I think it varies. There have, there have been, uh, there are probably as many stories as, as there are buildings. So the, the, need, the need to find a, is that me or you? Someone has a cell phone. To... <laughs> you. Uh, but, but the need to, to codify it and to say, if you do this and this and this and this, you get to the end. Uh, is probably a generic human tendency to try to explain it or to systematize it or to explain what the method is. There are, there are cases, for instance, now we're, we're doing a project with a tenant called Omelette, which is a sophisticated tenant, a new tenant. Parenthetically, I should say, the discussion keeps going. Mm -hmm. and, and so there isn't anybody involved in the process who is satisfied and who says, that's great, give me one of those. Mm -hmm. Which very often happens in the discourse of architecture when you get to a certain point and some, someone comes by and says, I like that, give it to me, but in red, right. you know, or something. And, and I think what's, what's important about the nature of the process is that there really is, I mean, it's easy to say, because now I think it's said a lot but, the, but if you see it, you can, you can understand the, the sense that what was satisfactory yesterday won't be satisfactory the day after tomorrow. So that there's, that there's a perpetual need to redefine it. So there are particular tenants with particular needs and particular requirements. We work with them particular spatial requirements and, and, and access requirements and operational requirements of various sorts and, and we work with them and accommodate them. But the spirit of working, I think, is, is a cooperative spirit and I think, you know, it's harder to get the first view, but, but in, in the aggregate now, there's, 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 there are quite a number of people who, who have seen the value of it. So I think progressively it gets easier to encourage companies to come into a context where they're not the only company on the street, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, so I, I, I do think it's important to see it as, as something which is in a perpetual state of ferment evolution. And I think, I think that doesn't happen without, without Frederick and Lori, I mean, it, it may sound uh, obviously congratulatory, self-congratulatory, but I think empirically it's so. I mean, they keep, they keep asking, and, and, and I think that's the essence of the thing, not to be satisfied with what it is, but to try to find something that it isn't mm. and see if we can do that. And there are a lot of interesting examples, experimental things, as, as, as Lori said, <coughs> things that we tried and worked, including a few things that we tried that didn't work sure. and had to be reworked. And, and they're willing to countenance that and to support that. And without that support, it's very hard to, uh, you know, to blow fiberglass on buildings and to bend glass right. and, and to do the kinds of things that are theoretically talked about, but in practical terms are not practical terms. Sure. And they support it. And there's this ongoing experiment, which is uh, you know, symbolic of the broader LA story that we've been exploring all day and through these exhibitions. You also have mentioned the careful calibration of uh, making sure that this experiment stays on track, that you, there are something like 600,000 square feet of projects still in the works and being developed now. So this is still going, and yet that mix, that philosophy, that that sense of community is important. It starts with the tenants. Um, and uh, it seems that when you sign a leasing contract with your development, it's also an expectation that you are, you're investing in them as much as they're investing in you. So um, where does that take us into the, the next phase of making sure that it's always, that you don't lose the kind of the spirit and the essence of, of the complex? 
Well, I, I know that for myself personally, I, I'm looking beyond myself. And, uh, you know, even Eric, you know, I, I, uh, we got Dolan Daggett and, you know, I want to set up projects for Peterson and Dolan and that next generation thing, you know, maybe Jonathan and Kurt, where they're going to be really enormously complex, both what goes inside them and uh, the buildings themselves as they'll express what goes inside of them. Um, you know, we're, we're about to leave the piston, well, pardon me, we we're going to leave the piston engine and we're about to leave the jet engine. And so we're developing a facility now that's the next generation of engine beyond the jet engine. So if you're going to try and go for those types of things, then you need somebody like Eric and, and Dolan. You've got to go to them and you say to them, you know, look, uh, I don't know exactly how this piece of machinery is going to be worked. It's used for radio pharmaceuticals now. It does other things, but eventually it's going to be used for something else. And that's something else let's plan for. And uh, the greatest thing about working with Eric and his team is that my father taught me that, you know, you should do retro engineering at the same time that you're building, which means you study historically what was built before and how they solve problems. And then you reverse engineer it as well. As you're building it, you figure out how to take it apart. And then in the process of doing it, you have something that will really stand the, the history that it's going to have to face. And I think that's what we've tried to do, at least I've tried to do it, and I've tried to, uh, you know, encourage uh, uh, Eric to do that and Dolan to do that, but Hugh and John as well. I mean, we go to the tenants, we have meetings with them about once a month, and we get as many as 30 of them in a room, and we start talking about, you know, how do you raise capital, how do you distribute things, and we're, we're doing this in a very active way because not only do I think that the holistic part of development sort of disappeared where you have construction, you have tenant management, and, and you have architecture, but, you know, I, everything's broken up into units and we have what's called professionals and the professionals really know to a certain degree the limits of whatever professionals are supposed to know. But you need integrators in there, integrators in there in order to make it something really viable. And I think that's what's happened. And the unique thing is, is that one day, Eric can lead. And the next day, Peter's brother can lead because he's very good at solving problems. And then the next day, somebody else leads. And this sort of organic uh, flesh is created. And uh, not like a slug, but in something more uh, affable and uh, ephemeral. And it kind of leads you forward. And I don't want to get lost in language for those of you who can't follow me because eventually I do that sometimes. But it's there and it's real. And what's really fascinating is that Eric doesn't even know this. I was just in Russia, in the south of Russia, and I got asked if Eric was a Chinese architect because he had done so many projects, they thought, in China. And I said, no, he's an American. But then I thought, man, how terrific it is that, that we can be universal in that sense, that they can't even identify our nationality. And that made me really, really happy. Now, did I answer any question? I don't know that I've rambled so long. I don't know that you answered Chris's question, which is a very, very difficult um, question that, that's always been facing us, but as we get older, is facing us more. Mm -hmm. And that is, uh, this can't be the Frederick and Laurie mm -hmm. story. This has to be something much, much bigger, much greater than two people. This has to be... Um, a project that continues, a success story that continues on, uh, that picks up its own volition, so to speak, its own energy. And I think that's where creating a team, counting on the next generation, etc. cetera. Um, we've never, ever sold a property that we acquired. We have hung on to everything, and sometimes financially it was really tough in bad times. It would have been so much easier to have sold something that we had built and made a profit. But we, we hung on to all the property because we're, we're seeking to create a whole that will only grow larger and larger, and we don't know what someone else might do if they get a piece of the property. But our ambition was always, and this is back way at the beginning, years ago, to go east and south, because east and south were the less privileged neighborhoods. 
and we wanted to just go as far as we could, as long as we could. One of our major, major um, uh, mandates is job creation because we're going into poverty zones and of course we believe strongly no matter what you give away free to underprivileged people, if you don't create jobs for them, the end is not in sight. They will never, their, their, their place in life will never change if they can't have a job and be proud and, and have self-respect and earn their own living. So job creation is, is a big deal for us. We've been fortunate in that we, we have created many, many jobs. And so we want to just keep going. And we're hoping we can attract more and more people to work with us, and we're hoping that other people will imitate us in the right way, that other people will buy property. We've always wanted that, that they would buy property nearby, find other really good architects willing to take the risk, and keep going, all, all of us together. And we're trying to do that in New Mexico. The, the uh, mayor of Albuquerque is here today, and I want to thank him very much for coming. And, we're going to try and create a complete team there that can do exactly in New Mexico what we did here. And I think that once we get the repetition, uh, you know, it's, it's going to be quite amazing. And I know uh, Mr. Carmen's here somewhere. I don't see him. But I know that he's very anxious also to do it in Washington, D.C. and Anacostia. And I feel that if we're able to uh, duplicate what we're doing and people be, begin to take charge, I think that, the, I, I, won't, I don't want to exclude you, but the three of us have started something that really might be a wave to something that's good and prosperous in the future. Excellent. I'd like to open it up for questions from the audience, if you have any. And I'll click through some of these things. So this is a before and an after. Any questions in the back? Could you, could you tell us more about the job creation? What kind of jobs and how many of those jobs come from the neighborhood and, and how housing is developed and food, uh, grocery stores and various kinds of community-based uh, infrastructures being developed in the area? Do you want to take it or do you want me to take it? Uh, I'll take you, you, you do it. Either way, well, I'll start and he can add in. Um, we have a very, um, very aggressive attitude about jobs being the key way to improve people's lives as opposed to things like low-income housing. We believe that low-income housing has failed to help the poor uh, get out of their, their mode and move on. Uh, Frederick um, was very inspired as a young journalist um, by doing some stories on Malcolm X. And what he learned, among other things, from Malcolm X was just that Malcolm X uh, felt that things like um, handouts to the poor will keep the poor in their place. And what the poor need is the way to make a living and move out of their place, so to speak. So the kind of jobs that we have created, so we haven't dealt with grocery stores, housing, or anything like that. We start with the, the key in our minds, the key factor is the job. And we've created professional jobs. We're not talking about uh, being a busboy in, in a market or working in a, a hamburger stand. Um, we are talking about professional jobs for the companies who are our tenants. And part of how we attracted tenants to this uh, place nobody wanted to go was, number one, of course, we had the architecture going up. But at the same time, we were trying to cut economic deals. And that's where Frederick was, was the expert. And, but what we could guarantee these people, these new tenants, was that there was a pool of people living within walking distance or not very far away, who were desperate to get jobs and that would work very hard and were open to being trained in new kinds of jobs. And the tenants came in and started hiring people all around in, in the neighborhood. And 
the whole neighborhood changed. Okay. Kodak's digital division was founded in our buildings and a, a part of their digital division was founded in our buildings and they had created programs for graphic designers that nobody knew how to use. So we sat down with them and dreamt up the idea of uh, getting taggers to become creative artists or graphic artists. And so Kodak brought them in, oh, you know, not by the bus loads, but they brought them in and over a period of about five years they put 700 kids or 600 kids through the school. They went from making zero income to making $65,000 a year. At that time when we did that, I know that because I remember the numbers. That One was of the, the early, things, let, me, let me say, early 90s. It was a fortune for, for gangbangers. And uh, w one of the early theses, that we, uh, theories that we had rather was that, you know, genius is equally spread between rich and poor. Uh, the rich actually maybe get lazy and don't really exploit their genius and the poor are always trying to exploit it in order to eat and live. So I thought if we could get them on some sort of a work process it would be helpful to them and we tried just to do that. So we've used all sorts of things to try and entice them into working in the various companies in our buildings. The startups love them because no startup gives everybody the best salary in the world, but they give you the best stock. <laughs> and then uh, we also had a uh, dance academy, which was in existence for 18 years, the last five of which was run by Debbie Allen, and is still in existence called the Debbie Allen Dance Academy, where they produced actually professional dancers by boys who were five foot 11 and couldn't, five foot 11 or under, and actually couldn't become uh, uh, football players or basketball players, but they were still great physical specimens. And at one point, we had in a, a 60 or 70 um, uh, male dancers uh, in the academy, and there was no other place in the world to find good male dancers, so we supplied the male dancers to Japan, and uh, I don't know, it was all over the world. New Hugh was York. there. <laughs> yeah, and, and you know, it was, it was sort of funny. And uh, at the same time, it was just a simple, 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 simple idea executed by people that are really good. And when you have a team like Eric and Dolan and Peter, and I, I don't want to go through the whole list, you know, you can do things like, like the best spring, is that, is that how you say it? Best spring floor in, you know, this part of the world. and Sprung. Sprung floor. And, you know, it, it, it was just quite amazing. And this thing that's in front of you, the Art Tower, is another outreach process where, you know, it, we will have artists, as you can see, artists uh, work on the tower, but it's really going to evolve into something quite, quite different. And uh, Jonathan uh, Miller and Kurt are working on that now, where we're going to try and just increase the graduates from high schools by 5%. And if we're able to increase it by 5% by giving them curious images and sucking them in and having courses for them and other things like that. Uh, and we practically have a major telephone uh, uh, company about to go to work with us on this. We think we can pull up a whole neighborhood by just increasing the high school graduation. And Mr. Carmen's helping us on that as well. Uh, uh, go ahead, I'm sorry. Another question there. Uh, you said in the beginning this, this was influenced by films, the architecture. Is that right? I couldn't this hear. What? That you were influenced by films in the beginning, the architecture. The architecture is influenced by films. Eric, has that been a part of, kind of your inspiration or the thinking of the whole project? You know, I don't know. <laughs> as I said, <clears throat> there are probably as many different stories as there are projects. I mean, I have, we've had some discussions over the years uh, about films, films that go back away, some of the Kurosawa stuff, uh, Kagamusha and Ron, and uh, those, those kinds of, of uh, films. Um, and then more recently, productions that have to do with digital development, like The Matrix, things like that, that, that have to do with environments and technical tools and, and uh, a kinetic sensibility for making space as if space is no longer designed with conventional drawings, but it's designed as an, as an animation so that the capacity to animate and a way of thinking about space animated in a technical sense uh, probably changes the way one, one can think about developing buildings in relation to tools. A matrix would be an example of that. Maybe we can flip it also and, and talk
talk about the fact that now this complex has also become a sort of soundstage. And Hugh, you were pointing out all the moments and areas where, uh, where you're working is often used for filming and for commercials and others. So it's now kind of, it's that feedback loop which just makes, makes this whole project unique to the LA experience as well of it inspiring new productions. I think just, I want to add one thing yeah. to, to this gentleman's question. Um, I'm not sure if you've heard about this, but I can just add one thing. Frederick had been so unsuccessful in trying to engage an architect before he met Eric, that he, when he saw T.S. Eliot's quartets, he, he got the inspiration, Frederick did, that maybe if I talk to this architect in the language of literature, art, film, maybe I can communicate better. So he would speak about, you know how Kurosawa did it in Ron, and you know how um, Matisse did it in such and such painting, and, and uh, you know, and he, Kierkegaard and Schopenhauer, Schopenhauer, he said, you know, strength of will, I want you to express that, you know, like a fist coming forward. That's the building on Ince Boulevard. Frederick was, was trying to find the way to communicate. And so he, he made those kind of references. Another question there. I noticed that one thing we haven't talked much about is politics. And yet I would expect there'd be some politics involved in any neighborhood redevelopment. Um, I think in the early 60s, we had a series of disasters in California, the Baldwin Hill Dams disaster, the uh, forest fires, and the Watts riots of 1965. And after that, it was very difficult for people to get insurance on houses or properties. The state eventually set up the California Fair Plan, which within three years became the largest insurance company in California. Now, this is just a case of insurance, which is necessary. But what about architecture and building? You said 97% of the property was vacant, unoccupied. What makes people want to go back in there? What gives them confidence? I suspect it has something to do with politics. Well, I'll just say, I, boy, I sure wish it could have had something to do with politics. <laughs> Does that answer? Um, Too much no, it. The, 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 the politicians were nowhere to be found. Uh, yeah. In other words, in the city we were working in, um, nobody wanted anything to do with that. Those areas were, as I said, redlined by banks. There's a certain profit in leaving certain areas of your city in poverty. And, uh, it's, and I don't want to get into that because that doesn't belong here. But I will say that in Culver City there was one politician who was great, and that was a guy named Albert Vera. And Vera was a, either the mayor or the, uh, on the council for 16 years. And uh, I loved Albert because Albert, if, if you disagreed with him, he'd come in with a bottle of scotch put it on the table, he says, I, I'm going to drink the whole goddamn bottle till, till we resolve this issue. And the, you know, the drunker he got, the louder he got, and the more disagreeable he got. And so they came to a conclusion pretty fast. Unfortunately, when he left, then everybody became analytic and much slower in making their decisions. Um, but that's for my own taste. We have really astute people who go in there and we're developing new ones like Ivan and uh, Dolan, and, and, and they can go into some place and they can talk through the political side of it. Um, but let me just say, cities are like people. They all have different personalities. We were in a city that, that had a particular personality that we had to struggle with. But on the other hand, I think, if I hope, this is uh, not improper to say, we have um, Mayor Richard Berry with us from the city of Albuquerque, which is a completely different kind of personality. We have a mayor um, who has come here to, to see learn. what we do and, and hear what we have to say about what we've done here in LA because he and Albuquerque are considering letting us do something in their city. And this is the good kind of politician. This is someone who is proactive, who goes out to do due diligence, if you will, but to see who are those people, what have they accomplished already, 
Do I want them in my city? That's the kind of politician that we love to work with. And so I don't want to just say all cities, forget it as far as politics, but our particular situation in Culver City was un until Albert Vera got on the city council um, in the very beginning, we had no one like that. This art tower that you're looking at, uh, the, the then present mayor of Culver City walked up to me and he said, why are you building this art tower? And I said, well, I want to do something for art. I want to give it parity with business, parity with commerce. I want to demonstrate the community that an artist can come in here and create some images and maybe the community will look at it and they'll be influenced by it. So, ah, why don't you build some soccer fields? And I said, well, that's the thing I want to do. I'd like to make uh, art have parody with the NFL, to use Mr. <laughs> Carmen's example. And, um, you know, it's, it is humorous that I can go anywhere in Kansas City and find a good football team, and I can't go anywhere in the boondocks of, you know, Iowa or South Dakota and find a really good symphony. And the reason for that is because we don't appreciate the arts. Well, we've got to do something to reverse that. Can I just jump in because that is, um, that is a trickle down passion which any tenant, I'm probably speaking for all the tenants, but even on our first day when you drove me around in your car and you said, all right kid, what do you want to do? You know, where do you want to be? And we, and we had no money and you said, well, incubate you. Uh, and he was talking about art and its importance and his passion for what he was doing led us and our management team to reach higher, reach for the stars, do more that we can do. And in terms of art, um, try to get our vision uh, out into the world. And there's no greater you know, reward than seeing that come true. And, and one of the projects that we even mentioned that you help us with is now opening at the Venice Biennale uh, tomorrow. We're actually opening at the, the Gardini. All of the images that we've created with the technology that you helped us um, value and envision is now a major international art exhibit um, and, it, and it, it starts from the top, I can tell you that. Um, we were always reaching higher because of the um, environment that we're in, so if you buy into the passion, you can do some amazing things, not only for yourself, but for company and creating jobs for us. There's, uh, there's probably one, one more point which is of interest uh, to people who design and who build and who work with sometimes uh, arcane political development process in American, uh, American cities. I think the, the team of people that work with the Smiths on, on these projects are extremely pragmatic. I mean, if, you, if you're sitting in Berlin with a friend who builds, having a beer at three in the morning, and, and you're listening to people with the conventional complaints about the political process as an obstacle to development and, and particular pieces of the political process that don't talk to each other and aren't particularly congenial and helpful and interested and they're self-serving and all of that. And I think we've, we've found a way to be pragmatic about it, not to, not to bitch about it, just to find the right uh, conjunction of personalities and people find ways to solve problems, because if you, if you continue to look at the, at the primary objective, which is to keep this discussion moving and continue to build, which is part of the energy of the place, by the way. You come over, there's always a crane, there's always something else going on, there's always something new happening, and people are sort of crowding around and looking at it. So I think even though the process is more difficult in some places, more congenial in other places, the attitude toward it has a lot to do with how you deal with it. And I think although there are the usual frustrations, I think generally the attitude is pretty healthy. And it's like, figure it out, let's get the right person in the right place and we keep going. Yeah, I think that. Uh, I agree with Eric and, and we have about 10 people who try to do that all the time. And, and when one of them becomes frustrated, we just turn it over to one of the others. And it sounds ridiculous. And we hold one or two back, you know, like we have a guy named Ed Wattel and we keep him away from everybody. But uh, uh, the reason for that is he's, he's, he's the saber-toothed tiger when it comes to figuring out uh, strategy. But I think in, in Albuquerque, what we see with a really gifted mayor who, who, who wants to turn his city around and 
is, is a real opportunity to assist him, to assist him. And uh, that's what we look to do. And we want the spotlight to be on him, not on us. And in a similar way, to be frank with you, I'm very happy that the spotlight has ended up in our buildings with Eric because I think he is a good representative to express what we do and certainly more articulate than myself. I, I also <laughs> just want to say really quickly that Hugh Milstein was very kind in what he said about us and it's wonderful to hear such compliments and of course we did try to, to do the right thing by him. But I think he is the perfect example of what I think all urbanists should aspire to being able to I hate to say create, but help to come to the surface. Since he said it, I'll, I'll say it. He and his partner came. They were total startups, no money, no one knew their names. Uh, we found a place for them in the office we were in, because that was the cheapest thing we could figure out to do. And they came from that to tomorrow night, the opening project in the Venice Biennale. I mean, it's like mind-blowing and I'm so proud of Hugh and John, what, what they have accomplished. And I think though, to take it out of the personal sphere, this, I hope, is what other people who build buildings, who design buildings, you know, architects and people who develop architecture, I hope that they will maybe see this kind of example and want to help inspire people that way in their own buildings. And our, and our buildings aren't built for us. Our buildings are built for him. Our buildings are built for Kurt. You know, he took a company, 40 people, grew it to 1,000 people worldwide. It's, that, that's, what, that's what we're after. And the people who, who come to us, who work within this sphere, feel it, they know it. Um, we have one guy that would be, all of you would love to know him. He has this incredible propensity to raise money. And, uh, you know, he came to me and he said, what do you think I ought to do? Maybe I should do a spiritual pass. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, you know, last year I raised 300 million. I said, just keep ahead. <laughs> keep going ahead. I mean, he can go into, to, uh, you know, I don't know, the Kasba in, in, in Syria and walk away owning half the country. It's... It's a gift, and you have to recognize him as an artist. And it's quintessential that he's with us. And we need geniuses like that. And since I'm in a state of design, and I mean, I'm in a place of design, and that's what the Getty's about, we have the, des well, I shouldn't say it this way. Let me correct myself. We have such a great design genius in Eric, and of course I'm overselling him. But um, You don't no, need to tell them they saw his work on the screen. They, they could see for themselves. She just stole the words from my <laughs> mouth. I was going to say, did you see the stream of the beautiful things that they designed up there? Come on. So we encourage you all to go to Culver City and see them in person for yourselves. Thank you all so much for your comments, your insights, and for sharing the story with us today.